welcome to Sandhills Webcast Data Intelligence. Do you understand your data? An introduction to Irwin Data Modeler and Web Portal. As per our invite, the Sandhill will be presenting answers to the following questions. What data do you have? Where's your data? And who is responsible for it? We'll be exploring the knowledge pyramid as a strong foundation for trusted, reliable data. I'll be introducing our presenter shortly, who will be speaking on today's webcast, but first, a few housekeeping notes. This webcast is being recorded, and we will follow up by sending out a link to the recording to attendees in the coming days. In, in addition, if any attendees have any questions, please use the dialog box to submit questions. At the end of the webcast, we will include the answers to all our questions in the follow-up communications. And with that, let me introduce our speakers. We have two very knowledgeable uh, speakers on the data management professional, professional side of the call today. Our first one is Don Solsby, Vice President of Enterprise Architectures, who knows anything and everything about metadata and data management in, the, uh, in his field. We also have Jeff Harris, who is our principal data architect, who is very strong in the, in the tool sets we'll be exploring, as well as the data management, enterprise architecture, and business and intelligence space as well. You're listening to Robert Lutton, Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer for Santel. And with us on the call, we've got Sophie, who is our marketing consultant, uh, who's been uh, coordinating all the efforts for this event. So with that, I'd also like to just have a, a quick update on our technology partner. Today, we are leveraging Irwin Technology, and Irwin is one of the most trusted names in the data modeling business and has been for over 30 years. Not many people know, and we want to make sure that it's, uh, it's announced that uh, Irwin uh, is now a separate organization that has been since March 2016. Um, and since then, it's expanded its focus from data modeling to a holistic data management environment, bringing innovation across the entire spectrum including enterprise architecture, business process modeling, data governance uh, with its tool sets. We'll be looking a little bit more about the entire common modeling platform at the end of this presentation, so stay tuned. So with that, I'd like to actually pass it over to Don to start with the agenda. Don. Thank you, Robert. Today we're going to talk about data intelligence. As Robert mentioned in the introduction, it's really about an understanding of the data that you have. And we're, of course, going to look at the DIKW pyramid, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, as a basis for that understanding and how to turn data into information. To do so, we have to identify what data exists and how to classify it into a search structure. We have to standardize the information that we have so we can find it easier. And most importantly, we have to have a visualization method to actually see where things are within the, meta, the data and metadata environment. And lastly, of course, we need to govern the data and the metadata. Data intelligence as a term, as coined by Techopedia, basically is dealing with the data to analyze an organization's operations and workforce to make better decisions for the future. And in that respect, data intelligence is not business intelligence. And the differences that they've highlighted are that data intelligence focuses on data used for future endeavors, such as predictive analysis, Whereas business intelligence is really the understanding of a business process, the inputs and its outputs, in effect, the data associated with that process. So as far as business intelligence goes, we've been using it for a large number of years, and there's really a hard promise that has been made from business intelligence over the years. But as it started about 20 odd years ago, standing in the burnt out embers of your house, a month later, you received a report, a report that your house was on fire. This is good information, but frankly, not very helpful. So as we've progressed then, we've created a whole bunch of different business analysis tools that provided a number of reports about how houses have burned in the past. But it always seemed to be that rear view focus of seeing the past and understanding it. So once again, a lot of great information, but not a lot of help. Now, of course, these days, we have these real time views of the world that can actually show you in frankly, virtually 3D, your house actually burning. But still, that's not the promise of business intelligence. It comes from your phone ringing, and it's a smoke alarm to tell you that I should take some action at home. So it's really about information in action rather than just purely a historical view of the world. What we've seen, however, is there will never be any less data than there is today, and we keep feeding more and more data into these machines that are collecting and disseminating it. 
In point of fact, a recent IDC study has said that by the year 2019, there will be 80 zettabytes of data, which is equal to one six trillion bytes of information that is out there. What is the consequence of all that data? Well, frankly, if you have way too much information, you end up with noise. There's a lot of people trying to get your attention from a data perspective. Frankly, what it leads to is overthinking the problem and ultimately analysis paralysis. You don't know which is the best data to make the decision on and you're given an ever increasing amount of data to make those decisions. The reverse is also true. If you have very little data to make a decision on, you end up with silence. You have no information to make a decision. What that typically ends up with? Well, frustration from making a decision, putting it into action, and then a series of unintended consequences. In other words, you have an uninformed response to the stimulus that you're asked to provide a response to. What we want to look at is the right amount of information. And we've looked to the DIKW pyramid, which has been around for 30 or 40 years, that says basically you start with data, transform it information, and based on that information, you have a set of decision making that can be done that comes around a set of knowledge to make those decisions. And ultimately, like the all seeing eye, we hope that that provides the amount of knowledge to decision makers to provide for wise choices in their decision making. So what business are you in? Well, good friend Peter Aiken, ex-president of data, said that your organization is frankly all about data until it's not about data. In other words, until you hammer that nail, frankly, everything else in your organization is data. You are in the data business. As opposed to being a data-driven company or a digitized company, you are a data company. That is what you manage, frankly. So if we look at knowledge management then, and it started in the 1950s, one of the original pieces of writing was by a gentleman named Kenneth Bolding from the UK, and he presented a variation on this hierarchy that was not so much data to information, but frankly signals and messages that turned into information. Or more precisely, I believe it actually came from the notion that was developed during Bletchley Park, that it was actually intelligence that came from signals and messages that were intercepted. Just as important as there was the content of the data, which is the actual structure and information in the message, was the metadata. In fact, if you remember the movie, it was the metadata that helped solve the problem by knowing it was the same operator on the same date with the same style of salutation that provided the foundation for the interpretation of the data. So, and in fact, what we looked at the problem is, yes, there was machines involved, but frankly, there was a fair amount of human intelligence and machine intelligence to make these decisions that helped break the Enigma code. So as we look to do this then, we do a similar thing from signals and messages to intelligence, and it's the transformation of data into information. And how do we perceive that stuff? Well, frankly, that happens through a set of transformations of data into information and not simply a translation. What we're really looking to do is add meaning, associations of the data into clusters or groups, and a level of understanding of the data in business terms. And that's really the adding of the context of data, effectively the metadata. So as we go forward, what we look at is the knowledge pyramid in a different metaphor. 1987, Milan Zelenny talked about the same DIKW pyramid in a slightly different structure. He said, first of all, you start with knowing nothing. And your first step, which is equivalent to the data step, is to know what you're talking about. And then certainly to know how that data was used really is the basis for information and then knowing why. So that's really where we're gonna look at it today from the DIKW Premier Pyramid perspective. We're gonna start with know what, move to know how, and hopefully provide, provide the foundation for knowing why. Traditional decision support systems have a similar pyramid. At the very bottom using data was the operational analytic systems, which were grouped together to form decision support systems and ultimately executive information systems. And as defined then, decision support was the collection of data in support of management's decisions, management information systems, if you remember the acronym MIS. The interesting part of that, however, was the volumes of data required to do these each different types of decision support systems was an ever evolving and growing amount of data till you hit the highest levels in these executive information systems. So I guess the assumption then is more data is good. More data equals more value, not necessarily true. In a recent study performed by the Veritas Research Group, 
they found that 52% of all data currently stored in an organization is of unknown or dark data, not knowing what it is, not knowing how it's used and what it's there for. In fact, 33% of all the data ends up being redundant, obsolete, or trivial, and it's absolutely no use. So it's only around 15% of all stored data is actually considered to be critical to operating the business. And that's a little report called the Global Data Burn Report. It's quite interesting, have a peek. The other part of this, of course, is we're dealing with unstructured data for the most part. 80 to 90% is non-tabular. This is data such as text, emails, images, videos, and frankly, social media. It appears, again, that we only have about 10 to 20% of our data that is structured. These are formatted data typically held as rows or columns in a table or a database. So if I look at the number of 15% and I look at the 20% of the tabular, it really means we're only leveraging about 3% of the entire mass of data we have in an organization to provide value to that organization. So what are we going to look at today? Well, we focus on digital online structured data. In other words, tabular data. And for anybody that's ever used a spreadsheet, you can explain what that is. It's a table. Within it, it has rows and columns and cells. More importantly to us, however, it is data that we use to manage the enterprise, and we can put it in the form of a schema. In other words, a data image of that information that is included in that database. We have a second problem, of course, and that's the inventory management around data. If anybody has taken a class in materials management, you remember the classic LIFO and FIFO, you know, data in an inventory management system, last in, first out, first in, first out. But in the data management world, we have a bigger problem. We have fish, as a coined by a friend of mine. He said, basically, with data, it's first in, still here. In fact, when we used to talk about data and process intersection, we called it CRUD, that a process creates, reviews, updates, or deletes data. But somewhere along the line, we seem to have forgotten the delete, and data sticks around for a very long time, whether or not it's useful. Now we have a problem. We have many uses that people are clamoring to get information that they can make decisions, but we've also found, because of the way we built systems with these data silos, that there are many sources that we need to integrate to provide the solution. So what we went up with is a complicated set of connections between sources and uses. And for anybody who's in the data management business, we realize that's a many-to-many -many problem. And we also know from data modeling that there is only one solution to a many-to-many -many problem, and that's a hub. So effectively, what we need to create then from the sources and use of data is to create a data hub. Further to the problem, of course, is we have this ever existing growing network of information across all the areas within an organization. Point of fact, the data assets are spread across this network in a lot of different places. And do we really know where those data assets are? We're growing in the cloud. So it's beyond just the physical network now into the cloud. And of course, with the growth of big data, we also have these data lakes. So there is ever amount increasing amount of data. And frankly, we don't want to boil the ocean. So what we want to talk about next then is an approach to dealing with knowing what you have from this notion of identity and classification and how to get started. So we're in the lower part of the pyramid now in the know what phase. And again, when we look at the entire galaxy of data that's out there, it's a very complicated world. But we recommend starting with something called critical data elements, CDEs. So the question is, how do I find my critical data elements? Well, somewhere in your set of policies, procedures, or probably somewhere in your mission statement, you probably have something that looks a lot like this. Data is a managed corporate asset. And much like a lot of other assets, such as a pencil or a locomotive, not all assets need to be managed the same way. In fact, most physical assets have mass. When I look at a pencil and I look at a locomotive, I realize that one's probably very much more expensive to manage and maintain, and certainly a lot more complicated mechanically for what it is. But as a far as data asset goes, there's one right there, and it has no mass. We have no idea how big, how important, or how small the information is. In fact, the number you see there could represent the quarterly sales amount. In fact, it's 137 and three commas, it's a comma and three zeros. So really it is the sales revenue amount that we're talking about here, or in fact, it could be the number of cans of tuna 
we use in a charity event for the Tower of Tuna contest. So both are valid pieces of data. They are in fact the same number, but without any sort of context, we have no idea how important they are. And I very much suspect that the sales revenue amount in terms of sensitive information is far more important than the number of cans of tuna we had. By the way, we kept the cans so next year we can do more cans and build a better structure. How do we find critical data elements? Two places to look, frankly, that are most important these days is the regulatory and commercial compliance reporting. We hear a great deal about regulatory compliance, but commercial compliance can be just as important. If you are a member of a value chain with a number of partners, there clearly is a set of compliance things that you must do from input to your systems and output that you provide to partners that has a level of compliance associated with it. But the big one we see these days, of course, is regulatory compliance. So let's use the example of GDPR, which is pretty much top on a lot of people's minds, given the impending action coming in May of 2018. What we should look at then is from those information structures that we created and the reporting we do to government agencies, we should start to look at what is in those reports, whether it's a critical report that is delivered to them or information that we provide to management or on public on a website. And frankly, what we should look at then is to discovering the data in terms of the columns that we've produced in those reports and look at the BI reporting. In fact, look at the metadata look at the columns that are provided in these reports and start to work our way back to the information that's in those and find the databases that have them. But the most important thing about to do that then is not to have a random set of data just hanging out there, but to actually try to classify them into a number of groups. This is how where we at Sandhill have the enterprise architecture prime six methodology that we use to help classify the data domains. And the data domains are more than just a subject area. Typical subject areas, frankly, just have a very large collection name, such as customer or product. But what we mean here is actually have a proper domain, that within the domains, there's enough information to provide the atomic structures that exist within an organization. So for the example of GDPR compliance, let's look at the prime six. The six primes that we have, frankly, start with the purpose, which is the GDR compliance, and first and foremost, in this example, of course, we want to look at the party domain. We want to look at the period domains. Certainly with things like lawful processing and explicit consent, we want to look at the data around process. And we want to definitely look at things around place, given that it's an EU regulation and where the data is collected and stored becomes very significant. And of course, we have to look at the actual product itself and how that's done. So given our classification of data domains and we work through building these atomic structures from a top-down perspective, we do something called concurrent data modeling. So we've, as we've said, we'll take our data domain model and we'll forward engineer that into a data structure model. That includes the entities and attributes at an atomic level that help describe that data domain. And then we can go to databases physically out there and start to reverse engineer by abstracting those databases into a physical data model. Now we have this data domain model and a physical data model, and together we bring them into a data structure model called middle out, so it's a concurrent top-down, bottom-up approach, and it's placed into a data foundation platform, otherwise known as a metadata repository. So I'd like to ask Jeff now to help us go through some understanding of the tools and technologies that can help us do this concurrent data modeling. Jeff. Thank you, Don. And yes, Jeff Harris here. Uh, we, we heard quite a bit about the concurrent data modeling approach. And we referred to the top down and bottom up. We're going to first just have a quick look at the top down approach. So pretty much when you work through the top down approach, you will approach it from your enterprise architecture prime six perspective. And as you can see there, we've got our six elements, <clears throat> party, product, period, purpose, place, process. And we work down from those. But for us to actually have a look a bit deeper into this, we're going to actually drill into the party environment. So by looking at party, we will see the typical uh, data domain model and how we expand on that to be able to see our party environment. Drilling into that, we will now see our 
personal identifiable information model, which is a subset of our party model. And from that, we can sort of see a concept of how we identify an individual or an organization, internal employee um, in our structures. So this is a typical example of how you would actually build up a subset of your party information, which is part of one of the um, data domains in your Enterprise Architecture uh, Prime 6 structure. So this is all the top-down approach. Let's have a look at it from the other side and see how Owen helps us to be able to get the bottom-up approach. So within Owen, we have functionality called reverse engineering, which allows us to be able to reverse engineer our models up from the bottom, uh, from the database itself, to be able to build up our structures as we would like to see it. Going through the reverse engineer process, we can understand all the basic concepts of reverse engineering and making use of the templates, et cetera, in our organization. We then land up getting to a point where we actually have ourselves a nice model of our database environment. So it's reflective of what is the bottom-up approach, typically what is in the database. So through these two processes, we come to the to the middle ground where we actually have a consistent view of that particular environment. Now that's all very nice and neat, so let's just take a big, bit of a deeper dive into understanding about how we manage it, and specifically with the GD, GDPR example that Don uh, has introduced to us of being able to identify our uh, private and sensitive data. So we have reverse engineered and we've pushed down from the top to be able to get our entity with a whole lot of data uh, objects in it, our attributes. And we get to a point where we actually want to start indicating the benefit of being able to manage this private and sensitive information. And Owen provides us with a lovely functionality called user-defined property or as it's most commonly referred to as UDPs. And through that, we can actually have a UDP that defines our data privacy settings for that particular object. And we can set it as either private, sensitive, or whatever the, the status is that we want to track and manage. And by doing that, you are indicating the value of how we want to see that particular Set of information. Once we've got that, we can then go through and use another functionality in, in the Erwin tool set where we can actually have add ins, separate programs that can interact with our models to be able to indicate uh, what, we, what, what is private, what is sensitive. And in this particular example, is a module that we've got the Erwin privacy data which then goes into our model and actually goes and reads all those UDPs and actually changes the color and the font based on the privacy setting. So through this, we can actually indicate what is sensitive, what is private, what is uh, important to us. And at the end of the day, we can then extrapolate that through our whole model and guess what? We've got a way of being able to manage all of that uh, GD, GDPR um, information in an holistic way in our model. So that's all very nice and neat. Once we've actually got our top-down, bottom-up approach, we've actually been able to manage the model itself. One of the key things that we often forget is a model doesn't live in isolation on its own. A model actually interacts with other uh, models or other databases. It interacts with reports. So there's a lot of interaction that goes on with our data environment. And quite often we sort of are inclined to forget about that aspect. And we just model the actual database or the models themselves. And we just think that there's this miracle that happens between our models and the particular reports. And as our little uh, 
example here. I think we, we need a bit more work here. So it's an area that we're always lacking to document effectively and manage. Taking that a bit more into the real world, uh, example, another example here is we've got a transactional system on the left and an analytical system on the right. And these two models have been modeled using our top-down, bottom-up approach very nicely, very effectively. You can see color usage. You can see all the fantastic bells and whistles in these models. But there's this big gap that sits between it, this big void of how they actually talk to each other. These are two isolated models, and it doesn't matter what we do, we're not going to actually really have any great value out of those models when we try and look at it from an enterprise perspective. So with that, Urban also provides another functionality that we can leverage. And this is the source to target mapping. Um, through this functionality, we can actually go in and say, okay, well, this particular data object, this, this attribute, this column, is populated from a different uh, database and explaining the whole ETL process. So we can actually then document this ETL process, where it gets it from, we can document what type of transform it occurs, and where it actually eventually lands up in our database. This is all very nice and neat, it works very well. The biggest challenge you got with this is it is a very time consuming exercise, and does take quite a bit to maintain and to, to capture and maintain this relevant information. So what we've done at uh, Samuel Consultants, we've come up with a tool that will help you to be able to do that. This is called the Data Lineage Importer. And this specifically goes in and you can take a Excel spreadsheet of your mappings, which is the most common tool that a lot of people use to document or to design your ETL processes. And it pulls it in and gets all of that um, source to target mappings, the ETL processes documented in your urban model. So through that, we can actually automate the process. It can also go into something like an Informatica XML file and read the data lineage from there. So using this sort of approach, we can then get to a point where we've actually got the source to target mappings all mapped out for us quite effectively. And the benefit of this, so if you've got a, something like the Irwin Data Governance Web Portal, you can actually trace that lineage from the source environment right through to the final target environment or backwards to see where the data came from. So it gives you the impact analysis and the data lineage of that particular data. Quite effective for the way we work and want to see an enterprise view. With that, I'm going to hand you back to uh, Don to take us through the next section. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff mentioned the word traceability. Traceability and trust are uniquely matched. If you go back to the mad cow scare of a few years ago, this was a pick, I clipped this out of the newspaper, it was a full page ad from Marks and Spencer that says, we can trace it so you can trust it. Very clearly, transparency, traceability are critical to achieving trust within our data. So by collecting all this information from the data models, the logical and physical models from the transaction systems, the logical physical models from the analytic systems, and certainly the information Jeff had mentioned from the ETL, this is all going back to information then that we have in our data domain model and the data domain model, because of, once again, it's done to an atomic level, becomes the information that is used as selection criteria for data entry, and certainly as the information that we would put into a dimension in an analytical data system. So we have this complete closed loop now of information going from the movement around the systems. But frankly, that's not enough. As we learned, if this is just all about data, and our little buddy there uh, sitting on the books, collects all that information, classifies it, and puts it into a library, much the same way you would do with the Dewey Decimal System. However, it's still machine information. It's still data in that construct. Effectively now, we need to go from know what that we have achieved with this set of models 
to knowing how. How is the information used? And more importantly than just how, is how it is used from the perspective of the business, not the technology people. So what we really need to do then is take the language of the business, that selected language that the individual businesses have, and they've put that into a thing called a glossary, which is frankly very similar to a database. But in this case, the glossary is a database of business terms. And what we really have to do then to be successful is take a look at that information that's in that glossary and connect it to our atomic information that we have in the data domain model. So how do we do that? Well, we know from the modeling efforts we've done to date over on the data element side that data elements are related to other elements and there's a certain hierarchy of how they're related. And these sets of relationships we define as keys, foreign keys and primary keys. The basic structure is things called a subject area or a data domain that then is provided into structures of entities and attributes. And at the attribute level, we again should be talking at the atomic level of an organization. So now we have this set of business terms as well that we need to connect to the data elements. Interestingly enough, business terms have a similar type of construct to the data element structures in that the business terms are related to other terms and they're in a hierarchy typically. The hierarchy often starts as a business concept or a category, such as this is a brand or a product, and then works its way down to a set of business terms that can be very largely defined. We have to get those elements down further to something called a qualified term, which in effect almost becomes a one-to-one -one with an attribute. In fact, it's not one-to-one -one, we found is those terms still have a many-to-many -many relationship with the data elements. That many data elements can point to a single qualified business term and one qualified business term may end up with data, many data elements. And as we've seen earlier, the best way to solve a many-to-many -many problem, frankly, is that associative entity. And we call that the shared data, which really are the critical data elements that help us define the one-to-manys between those critical data elements, their associated business terms, and their data elements. So let's take a look now as how we can try to manage that sense of relationship and frankly how we add the business terms to the data elements. Thanks, Don. I will take it from here. The principle behind the what's you are putting there, let's have a look at it from the technical perspective. So how do we take those business terms and link it up to our data elements? And within the Urban Data Governance Web Portal, we like to be able to represent our business terms. So we can actually create a glossary in Urban Web Portal that has all of our business terms, our glossary. And we can then navigate, search, interact with that to be able to link it down to, uh, to understand that particular term. But how do we link it down to our tables and models? That's the fundamental aspect that we need to understand. So let's go through an example where we can actually find a term and we're looking at finding the customer term. We can navigate into it. We can manage our term. So being able to manage our term gives us the ability to be able to understand what the definition is, the data types, all of that type of information, which can relate to understanding what the business uh, glossary, the business dictionary is all about. So this glossary can be managed, and through the Irwin Data Governance Web Portal, we have the extended functionality to be able to manage those terms. We can create terms, we can re have a review process using the collaboration capability out of the uh, Urban Data Governance Web Portal and the workflow capability to pass it through a approval process. So we can go through and actually submit a particular term for approval and have our fellow colleagues actually review it and they can actually collaborate to make definitions um, to make the terms meaningful as it reflects in the business. And we can deprecate and discard them, etc. So the workflow engine is very powerful for managing these particular terms. And once we've actually got to the point of actually understanding the terms that we've got, we need to be able to put that against the models that we're using. 
and specifically our data domain model. Now, when we think about it from a lineage perspective, in Irwin, we can actually map all this information in the Irwin data models. So we can see all these type of uh, lineages, which is referred to as semantic lineage, data lineage, all of that is all done in the Irwin models. But understanding that our glossary is actually not even reflected within the Irwin data models, we have this dilemma of how do we actually put the two together. And this is where we've got a functionality in the Irwin data data governance web portal called the semantic mapping. And this is where we take our glossary terms and link it up to the uh, data domain model objects and to be able to build that linkage as Don put there as a critical data element linkage between the two. So by doing this, we can then actually have a consistent view from the business term value right down to where we actually store this in our models and in our databases. And quite literally represented here in the um, in the Irwin uh, Data Governance Web Portal, how it links down from the actual term to the actual objects and right through to wherever it's been reflected within the databases itself. And when we get to the point of coming back to understanding the overview of our data environment, we've got the spaghetti junction of data all over the place. We need to now start making sense of all this information. And that's where the data governance web portal has come in by leveraging the um, EAP6, the Enterprise Architecture Prime 6, functionality, we've been able to link our glossary terms to that, and then that can then filter down into all of our databases. We've also spoken and shown you a little bit about the data movement capability, where we can actually reflect the data lineage, so where data flows through our various systems. And then once again, we link back up to our glossary, showing us the semantic lineage. So through this, we got the cyclic ability to be able to see where our data is and with which points and where all we can trace it. So with that, I'm going to pass you back to Don to take us through the next phase. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, hopefully you've seen how we've demonstrated the know what and know how that really talks to the transformation of data into usable information. The last part we want to talk about in this session here is about knowing why. And that's the reason that we have the data in the first place and its usage, effectively the governance of the data. We look to a model that has been provided from the CMMI Institute called the Data Management Maturity Model. And it speaks to the five fundamental structures within data management and supporting processes to be able to govern your data in an appropriate manner. Interesting that it comes from the CMMI, who is famous for its five levels, starting from level one through level two and three on, you're just doing things, you're managed or you're defined, is applying that same set of principles from the CMMI now to a data management model. And as we start to look at the different levels associated with it, we start to see what happens and how we can observe the behavior. At level one, it's a very people-oriented process. The data management activities are frankly performed only at specific project, project levels, and as a result, data governance is quite limited. In fact, if I go into an organization and I walk around the area where there are programmers and I see something like a go-to person on somebody's, on somebody's cubicle door, that to me right away tells me that this is a level one organization. They're very people dependent. We proceed to level two then more at a program level. And this is where the enterprise data management structure is really a staff starting to establish some policies and roles and responsibilities around connecting data and in a sense decoupling data from projects and start to looking at it at a program level. This is where we start to look at major programs and subject areas and where in effect the methodology of the EAP Prime 6 becomes very critical to understand because we want this to be a repeatable process as we start to deliver it. And that frankly is what level three is. 
It's talking about a repeatable process that as you gather more information, the information is collected into a single place that is available across the enterprise. So we now see that the data management structures, certainly things like metadata repositories, have become centralized for an organization. We see a significant level of executive exposure, sponsorship, and governance. And we now see that the CDEs, the critical data elements, become important structures that are identified, managed, and governed throughout the organization. If we look specifically around data itself, it's really about form and substance. If you speak to an internal auditor or somebody in the accounting world, the form and substance of data, frankly, as we look at the data management model, really factors into the data governance part of the DMM, which is about structure, metadata. And the data quality side really is about the content. So if we look at form and substance in terms of data then, the form is about data structure and its context, the metadata, and the definition and meaning of the data, as we saw by connecting it to the business glossary. Over on the content side, it's really the substance, the actual content of the data, things that are in the cells. And what, what we're looking for then is for the data quality dimensions and the set of standards by which we judge if it is qualified information. And we'll be talking about the data quality side of the house in a later webinar. But today we're gonna to be focusing on the data governance side. So what is data governance in the DMM? Well, it's the best practices around ensuring broad participation in the practice and the oversight. And that's a critical thing to understand about oversight is about measurement and metrics of the effectiveness of the data management programs. And its constituent parts are around governance management, specifically stewardship, roles and responsibilities around data governance, certainly the business glossary, the business term management, and how it connects to the data in databases, which is really part of technical metadata management. And here we've seen and hope we've shown you that the Irwin Data Modeler and certainly the data governance web portal are some very good tools and technologies to help automate that process. So let's talk a bit about governance management then. People talk a great deal about the data steward. We believe that there actually are a number of stewardship roles. Given that we're dealing with tabular data for the most part, we're dealing with rows and columns and cells. So if we start to look at individually the different components then, the governance steward is around the data metadata. Again, it's about the structure. This is the party who is responsible for the decision about what data the enterprise will collect and maintain. Think about it yourselves when you create an Excel spreadsheet that when you put a new column in, effectively what you are doing is creating this structure, this form, that you are now committing your organization or yourself in that case with Excel spreadsheet to collecting and making sure that the maintenance of that information is done to its utmost level of quality. Not a small task. However, we're also looking at the actual cells, which are the content of the databases and the tables. There we're talking about a data qualification steward because now that we've set up the structure and the metadata, this is the party responsible for making sure that the entries into the database, into the cells, have the constraints or business rules that have been specified by the metadata. In fact, dealing with substance. There is a third stewardship role right around the rows, which deals more with the processing of data. Once again, we'll be speaking about that in a later webinar. So what's important? Well, again, we've learned over the years that you can't manage what you can't measure. So it's very important to understand, particularly in the context of the data management maturity model, what level you are at and what level you are trying to achieve. And you have to do that by measurement. Well, what is measurement? Well, frankly, it's some observed structure, some observed piece of information, and it's put against a standard and typically done as a ratio, normally a percentage that you're 50% complete or otherwise. But the interesting part of this, of course, is the standard keeps changing. How can you actually make any sort of analysis? For example, in one month, you divide it by 10, and you divide it the next month by 11. Without the set of standards to make your measurements, the metrics and the analytics you provide are actually quite meaningless. Second part of this is you can't measure what you can't find. So you don't have a filing problem anymore. We've spent 30 odd years figuring out how to put things into databases. Our big challenge right now, of course, as we know from our discussion of dark data, is how do we get it back out again? Well, the, one of the most important things about searching for things, of course, is what do you call it? And I hearken back to the two Ronnie's sketch of the four candles or the fork handles. So basically, it is important to understand that when we name something, the name actually has to be consistently defined and have some meaning. And there, Sandhill has developed a 
product that helps you do some of that standardization of names and domain standards. Jeff. Hi, thanks, Don. Yes, uh, the product is EMSOS and Enterprise Modeling Set of Standards. Now, what EMSOS is, is really a set of standards that define your uh, data objects procedures behind them, the best practices. It also goes to the point we of defining the template. So the Irwin Data Modeler template that you would use to be able to reuse these standards. And it comes with workflow engines, it comes with a reporting tool. So there's a whole lot behind it to be able to make it uh, your corporate standard and to be able to help you adopt a standard in your environment. So that once again, you can come back to being able to measure it with your observation over a constant standard. Now, the important thing about it is it's not only about new models or new requirements. You can actually use it on existing database models. So you can actually start measuring your database models from where you came from to where you are actually going to. So you can measure over time your progress. And as per the uh, compliance report that we've got here uh, um, shown to you. It's showing us how we have are progressing with a particular data model and how we are slowly adhering to all the standards as we go forward to the point that we will obviously achieve a certain goal with our data models, but we can measure it the whole way because we're always measuring against that same set of standards. With that, I'm going to pass you back to Don. Thank you, Jeff. We're looking at another aspect then of the data management maturity model, and that relates to the data architecture capabilities. And within the DMM, it's called platform and architecture, which again are the best practices and methods and standards for implementing data management across in and integrated to the many data corporate assets and to supporting the business objectives. As we start to look at the different components of it then, we see the architectural approach that is used and that we link to the data domain methodology we have, the architectural standards, which we've just seen. And notice, again, we have the data integration. A good deal about that integration relates, again, to the transaction and analytical systems. And there, in fact, is the last element of the platform and architecture is the historical data and how one deals with it from an analytical perspective. And we see here, of course, that we have the Sandhill products, the Enterprise Architecture Prime 6, and the enterprise modeling set of standards. So with all that put together then, we have these series of schemas and models that we all put together into this foundational structure. And again, the whole notion of trust and traceability comes from the visibility, the transparency. By adding all of those models into the portal environment, connecting them to the glossary, we now have this complete picture that shows us both the data movement lineage, from a data technical perspective, and certainly the connection back to the semantic layers of the organization that allows us to go back and forth when change happens and to understand. Thanks, like uh, what we'd like to do is really cover how Sandhill can help in this area. So what we what we look to do is we look to have a map, right? So, and we use the DMM CMMI uh, maturity model as that map as our guiding light. Once we have our map, we then need to know uh, the following items. We need to know where we're at, right? And of course, this is pretty essential because uh, we do this through the gap analysis of identifying where you're at and what your current maturity is. Once we know where you're at, then we the next question we wanna ask uh, from an organization is where do you wanna get to? And organizations can achieve different uh, uh, you know, want to achieve different directions and uh, sometimes they want to get to a, a certain maturity level or they want to have certain key functions that uh, that are important to the organization. So that's where we then begin to map the route that uh, we, uh, we uh, provide, which is through uh, the wayfinding approach. And obviously the way we do that is through the uh, DMM assessment. Um, when we look at the assessment, uh, it covers 26 different specific data management areas. And as Don had mentioned before, um, obviously in the space of data management maturity, certain uh, organizations may have a priority on getting maybe their program funding or the metadata management or, 
quality assessments, other measure and analytics up to a level three, and you're quite happy to have some other levels remaining at a level two because they want to focus on the priorities. That's where the, the DMM assessment and strategy from Sandal Consultants really helps an organization prioritize and identify the roadmap on how to get to those next uh, endeavors. So in the course of the presentation today, we've actually seen how we actually turn uh, data into information. And that's where you know we've been focusing on, and obviously where Don talked about the metadata intelligence. That's the key what we bring to the organization. Through this metadata intelligence, through the leveraging of EA P6, and through the standards and technology and modeling technologies, uh, we are actually able to help organizations provide trusted, qualified information for, for decision makers. Uh, basically, if you like, uh, business intelligence. For the chief data officer. So we've actually seen some of the tool sets that uh, that Erwin has in their common modeling platform through today's presentation. In fact, we've actually seen not only some of Erwin's technology, but also some of Santel's uh, supporting technologies. We've looked at the data modeling uh, tool sets. We've looked at the uh, data governance and their web data portal in that area. Uh, also, I've mentioned at the beginning of the webcast, we will be talking a little bit about the entire vision that Erwin has got out there on their common data foundation platform or their common modeling platform, as it's known. They have built and are building a host of additional uh, SaaS-based, web-based platforms, such as business process modeling, the enterprise architecture solutions would exist, that have and leverage shared capabilities across a data foundation platform with obviously multi-deployments on-site or in the cloud, uh, with multiple uh, uh, connectors and uh, traditional clients and communities out there for uh, the different uh, users that want to interact with the uh, data platform. So we leverage the uh, the users and, and the technology, but one of the things we wanted to mention is how Sandhill, with our technologies and our expertise, uh, supports the uh, implementation the understanding, the training, and the end-to-end -end solutions of tools like the Erwin Data Model Portal, uh, the Erwin Data Model Tool, or the Data Governance Web Portal. And of course, uh, we obviously focus on our approach of the governance area, and obviously in the architecture area in this particular webcast. So with that, I'd like to mention that if anyone uh, is interested in more in-depth demonstration, of the Irwin data modeling tool or the data governance web portal or Santos EA6 methodology or EM SOS uh, set of standards, uh, please feel free to visit our website, uh, irwin.uk.co.uk, uh, uh, or we will follow up in the next uh, coming days from our uh, UK contacts, uh, David and Sophie. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.